In this BCO Sundays at three, Rebecca Smithhorn dives into Beethoven's Piano Concerto Number no. Two, which we'll hear on our second subscription concert. Take it away, Rebecca. Welcome back to BCO Sundays at three, where we're exploring all five of Beethoven's piano concertos. Last time we talked about the first piano concerto and got to know the young Beethoven, a talented kid from Bonn trying to make good in the big city of Vienna. Today we're going to explore the second piano concerto, and as we do, we'll talk about Beethoven's assimilation, or not, into Vienna's cultural life. Now, you may remember from last time that Beethoven got his first big break when Joseph Haydn visited his hometown of Bonn and agreed to take him on as a student. So Beethoven packed his bags and traveled to Vienna, where he was to study with Haydn, make connections, and generally soak up all that the city's rich musical life had to offer. And while we have an image of Beethoven as this uncompromising individualist who didn't give a flying fig about what anybody thought of him, when he first came to Vienna, he got some new clothes, he did his hair, he tried to fit in. But tried is the key word here, because Vienna's aristocracy was a tough room. On the one hand, there were a lot of serious music lovers in Vienna's ruling class. These were people who played instruments at a near professional level. They commissioned new pieces from the city's most prominent composers. They had music libraries containing thousands of pieces and books on music. Some of them even had small concert halls in their homes, the same way someone might have an in-home movie theater today, or an in-palace movie theater, I guess. And as a composer and a performer, Beethoven was an instant hit among the city's musical connoisseurs. His music, and especially his playing, was exciting, it was dynamic, and he had no shortage of musical supporters in the city. But on a social level, the Viennese were not so nice. One woman said, He was small and plain looking, with an ugly, red, pockmarked face. His hair was quite dark and hung shaggily around his face. His clothes were commonplace, and he spoke in a strong dialect and in a rather common way. He was without manners, both in gesture and demeanor. Burn, Frau von Bernhardt. She goes on to talk about how Beethoven refused to play for them until a countess got on her knees and begged him to. And here we have a microcosm of Beethoven's tortured relationship with his patrons. They admire his genius, but they look down on him personally. He resents it, he behaves badly, they look down on him even more, and on and on down the spiral of dysfunction. A psychologist would have had a field day analyzing this. But, you know, right city, wrong century. Keep in mind that the Viennese aristocracy was teetering on the brink of extinction, and to make matters worse, they were staring down the ghost of revolution's future as they watched Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette and a whole host of others brutally executed across the border in France. This collective anxiety spilled out in a couple of ways. For one thing, by the time Beethoven arrived in Vienna, it was a police state. There were informants everywhere, and state censors were clamping down on pesky words like liberty, equality, and fraternity. And Beethoven writes, People say that the gates leading to the suburbs are to be closed at 10 p.m. The soldiers have loaded their muskets. You dare not raise your voice here, or the police will take you into custody. That wasn't an exaggeration. Police were regularly jailing political dissidents. But, he says, I believe that so long as an Austrian can get his brown ale and his little sausages, he is not likely to revolt. Oh, Beethoven, always calling it like he sees it. And moreover, the upper class had reached a point of cultural decadence. They had too much time, too much money, and too little to do. Time is wasted getting dressed for parties, writes one socialite. It's wasted traveling to them, on the staircases waiting for one's carriage, on spending three hours at table. And in these innumerable gatherings, one hears nothing beyond conventional phrases. So sure, Beethoven could certainly be rude and surly, but when he angrily refused to participate in the dinners and the parties, as he often did, he may have been avoiding things that any sane person would find extraordinarily tedious and time-consuming. 
And it's worth remembering that Mozart, who had also worked in Vienna, had many of these same resentments. Now, the person who did very well in Vienna was happy, even-keeled Joseph Haydn, who was always on good terms with his patrons, his publishers, his students, well, most of them anyway. The relationship between Haydn the teacher and Beethoven the student ultimately fizzled. And this was probably in part a mismatch of expectations. Haydn was basically a celebrity teacher, helpful because of his name recognition, but not especially interested in monitoring Beethoven's day-to-day -day progress on counterpoint exercises. But the other problem was that Haydn built a great career on a great job as the Kapellmeister at the Esterhazy estate. Now, Kapelle is a catch-all German word for a court music program, usually with orchestra and chorus and church musicians, run by a Kapellmeister, like Haydn. For most of his adult life, Haydn had total financial and professional security, and it allowed him to be incredibly productive and original. But he couldn't steer Beethoven toward that path because just 40 years later, that path no longer existed. One publication says, it was formerly the strong custom that our large princely houses possess their own house capellan. It can only be coldness for the love of art, a change of taste or economy, that this laudable practice has disappeared and one capella after another has been extinguished. A steady court position was just no longer an option for a musician like Beethoven. Instead, it was a piecemeal career of private patronage, self-produced performances, and selling works to the highest bidder. Beethoven was working in a gig economy. So where does the second piano concerto fit into all of this? Well, it speaks to the slightly chaotic nature of Vienna, both politically and artistically, that we don't know for sure when the second piano concerto was premiered. It was probably at a benefit concert in 1795, but whenever it took place, it was definitely Beethoven at the keyboard. Now, Beethoven added his own disclaimer to this second piano concerto. He described it as, quote, not my best, a compelling endorsement. But Beethoven was ruthlessly critical, so we shouldn't take him too seriously. If anything, this concerto shows a side of Beethoven we don't often see. The first movement is elegant, it's transparent, it has this kind of classical balance to it. Not qualities we usually think of with rough and rowdy Beethoven. Let's listen.
we were playing Guess the Composer on that first movement, I would give you partial credit for guessing Mozart. Beethoven is clearly modeling himself after his musical idol. But in the second movement, Beethoven starts to sound a little more like himself. Because Mozart, the opera composer, loves to create these beautiful, long, singable lines in his slow movements. And we get a little bit of that from Beethoven, but what you really hear is him playing with atmosphere and texture, like in this spot where the piano plays just these feathery chords over plucked strings while the winds get the tune. It's more about the sonic landscape than it is about the line. And at the end, far from a gorgeous long singing line, the piano's phrases just get shorter and shorter, almost like it's running out of things to say in this very intimate conversation with the orchestra. Take a listen.
And then the last movement is a toe-tapping, catchy tune. And here we get to see a little of Beethoven's commercial side. Because while he was known then and now as a composer of large-scale, challenging works, he still had to pay the bills. And to do that, he would often write catchy, tuneful piano pieces for the general public to play at home, not unlike this one. Now, if you want to amaze your friends with your knowledge of some cross-genre musical trivia, here is a fun fact for you. The very first rhythm you hear in this movement is called a Scotch snap. It's a distinct short, long rhythm that comes from Gaelic English. Think lussies and luddies, short long. You hear it in bagpipe music and traditional Gaelic songs, and of course, it made its way to mainland European concert music like this concerto. But because a lot of Scots and Irish immigrate to the United States, it also plays a role in American English. And American English influences the music of hip hop, where the Scotch snap is a key rhythm to this day. By the way, this is a truly fascinating Google rabbit hole if you've got some free time on your hands, and I know you do. So the rhythm you hear at the beginning of this movement begins in the ancient Scottish countryside, makes its way to the music of Cardi B in the 21st century, stopping for an appearance in the music of Beethoven and friends along the way. All that in a little two note rhythm. Isn't music amazing? Hear it for yourself.
Come back on February 28th for the next BCO Sundays at 3 as Jonathan Pilevsky speaks with our soloist for Beethoven's Piano Concerto No. 2, Xiao Hui Yang, and you'll hear her beautiful performance of Ravel's Sonatina. <laughs> 